Hey, Margie here. Did you know that food is pain medicine? So many of us have pain and we think it's just a natural part of aging that we have to live with. Or no big deal, I'll just take some pain medication. But the good news is there's so much we can do. And today we're going to focus on natural approaches to pain management with our very special guest, Dr. Lily Rosenthal. And Dr. Rosenthal is an expert in lifestyle management with a focus on injury prevention, pain management, and integrative health. Dr. Rosenthal is a DO, and she's a board-certified physical medicine and rehabilitation physician in New York City. Dr. Rosenthal's philosophy of patient care offers a personalized treatment program which supports optimal health and well-being. She sees a variety of patients in her Manhattan practice, including world-renowned musicians, dancers, choreographers, and writers, as well as marathon runners and other athletes. She is also a consulting physician for the New York City Ballet, American Ballet Theater, Metropolitan Opera, MTV Video Music Awards, and several Broadway productions, and is herself a dancer and marathon runner. Her media experience includes national television appearances on The Dr. Oz Show, and she's been featured as an expert source in a number of publications, including U.S. News and World Report, The New York Times, Consumer Reports, and The Huffington Post. Dr. Rosenthal is an author, educator, and a media spokesperson for the American Osteopathic Association. And today we're focusing on all things that can be done to help pain. And it's really full of great tips that you can put to use right away. And I promise you, the end of this talk you will have a whole new thought process on pain and things that can be done. So stay tuned. Welcome, Dr. Rosenthal. I'm just really excited to have you on the podcast and the piece that you're bringing to the puzzle today is going to be so terrific. So welcome. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here, Margie. And I just have to tell you, I I have to tell the audience how we met because it's so crazy. (laughs) I mean, this is, you know, this is just sort of strange. I'm reading an article and I'm reading about this woman who uses her prescription pad instead of writing on a prescription, she writes fruits and vegetables or diet or, and I said, oh my gosh, who is this? And started reading about her and it was Dr. Rosenthal. And so I wrote a note. I said, I absolutely love how you practice medicine. And I just was so interested in everything she talked about and asked her to be on the podcast. And she said, yes. So here she is. And today, though, with the topic that we talk, are going to talk about is plant-powered pain management. Lots of peas, because it's so important. And so many people are just taking pills for pain. And it just starts a negative cascade that can affect every aspect of their health. So why don't we just start with how you... Let's talk about your backstory, how you got to do what you do, because you're not doing the typical writing prescriptions and, you know, you practice a little differently. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got to do the type of medicine that you practice today? Sure. I'd love to share that. I love, first of all, I love what I do. Um, I love just sort of moving the needle forward and getting people to feel and function their best. And when I went to medical school, I really took it seriously that first we do no harm, right? So I really have, after 30 plus years of practicing medicine, I can't believe it. Mm -hmm. Um, I first of all chose to be an osteopathic physician because I always had this idea. Growing up, I was a dancer, not professionally. um, And I also ran a food co-op in college. So that kind of ties into, I'm sure we're going to be talking a lot about food today and how I literally prescribe food as medicine. So I always had this idea of sort of how to take care of my body and sort of a little health oriented, but, and I chose osteopathic medicine specifically because of the philosophy of it, that the body can heal itself, right? And it's a little more integrative. So I'm a regularly regularly practicing physician. I can prescribe medication as an osteopathic physician, but I choose to dig deeper. I'm a pain management physician. So people come to see me generally, Margie, in my, in my practice, because they're having some sort of pain, neck pain, back pain, carpal tunnel, nerve pain, joint pain, arthritis, whatever it may be. And I take that opportunity because again, first do no harm, right? Body can heal itself. It gets my wheels thinking, let me figure out 
what's the root cause of their pain? Where is it coming from, right? So rather than just prescribe a medication that treats symptoms of pain, even though everybody wants to be out of pain, that is clearly not the best, deepest, most investigative, sustainable response to my pain patients. I feel like my job, and I take it very seriously, is to figure out why they got into pain, what they can do about it, how I can help them in a first do no harm sort of way. And my tools for that are certainly science and evidence-based, but unfortunately, a lot of doctors and practitioners don't really think to do that. They just think to kind of treat symptoms. But what I look at is I do a really deep dive and again, where the pain is coming from. And a lot of the pain I see is mechanical. So I do a very very deep kind of comprehensive structural evaluation. It may seem funny to, you know, in this technological age where, especially now COVID, we're all on Zoom and technology. My best diagnostic tools to figure this out literally are my eyes and my ears and my hands. And I can get so much information, the ears to listen to the history, right, of where the pain is coming from, what's it like, what's the frequency, what's the, the, the tenor of it. Um, my eyes to observe, right? Posture, structure, what's going on with the patient, even mood of the patient gives me some information. And then my hands, which are registered literally with the state of New York as a doctor (laughs) to be able to look at the tissue texture, the changes, the mechanics, the range of motion. So this is really what I do as a doctor. And I think of myself kind of like uh, I, I wrote an article on this too, is um, rethinking the pain puzzle. I think of the, when somebody comes in with a pain complaint, my thinking is that, let me figure this out. It's a puzzle. What is causing it? And then we can certainly talk about treatment. So. You know, I love that. As a physical therapist, we are so on the same wavelength because so often people think, oh, I need, I have a headache. I need the migraine medication. Or I have this not realizing that just as you said, pain is information. It's giving you, it's giving you like some clues to what's going on. So how much better than covering it up and masking it than getting to the root cause and treating it. And then you can sort of stop it at its source versus a whole lifetime. And what I see so much with people with osteoporosis is a lot of young athletes that they lived on Advil or they lived on medication because they had pain and they didn't realize that maybe it was overuse or whatever it was. And then it continues. And then it continues to GI problems and all Uh, sorts of things later on. So it's just this negative spiral. So I love the way you present that. So, okay, the person comes in, you're going to structurally, that's one thing that you look at, which I think is so important, so missed. And I, I don't think that doctors mean to miss it. I just think you as an osteopath have those tools. That's not taught in medical school to look at someone's posture. Am I right? I, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. It seems so basic. Um, that's osteopath. I'm also a physiatrist. I'm also a specialist in non-surgical orthopedics. Not, not psychiatrist, but physiatrist, which is a specialist in physical medicine and rehabilitation. So I have my osteopathic training and the skills, yes, to look at very detailed structural but I'm also a non-surgical orthopedist and to be, it's a professional bias, but if you don't need surgery, going to a, a non-surgical specialist is sort of the way to go there. But I want to just rewind and say that you said something about people eating Advil. I like you see a lot of, I see a lot of, I actually have a sub sort of specialty interest in, I treat a lot of dancers and musicians and their musculoskeletal problems. People think like what musicians, yeah, playing a violin for, you know, eight hours a day is very structurally uh, demanding. But I just want to have a short little story about the Advil. I call it my three kidneys story. Um, I have three. So it's not only you say doctors. Yeah, doctors aren't, some aren't trained and some forget their basic training. And I hate to say it, but sometimes it's just time. You know, the average doctor visit in this country is six minutes, um, which is really, really poor. And in that amount of time, yeah. In that amount of time, the only thing you could really do for pain is write for a prescription or a procedure to like, you know, an MRI or an x-ray, which really isn't, it, it's, it's just not getting to, again, the root cause of it. But back to the kidney story. I have three colleagues and friends that are physicians themselves, right? So it's not just people who are sort of like 
uneducated about their bodies or health maybe that are taking Advil. Three doctor friends that have had various musculoskeletal problems, knee pain, back pain, wrist pain, and three of them proceeded to just eat Advil, you know, to make the pain go away and not investigate the root cause. One of them now has hypertension because it affected the kidneys, so it, they couldn't clear, couldn't clear the wa their water, you know, correctly. The other, to a point unbelievable, also killed his kidney function. The third, to a point where his wife had to donate a kidney to him because of chronic anti-inflammatory use. So this is no joke. Just because you could buy it at Dwayne Reed over the counter, you know, taking medication to cover up pain is just never a good idea. I say that as a, a caveat to all your viewers and listeners, that it's really, really important to go see somebody who's going to look deeper and do a deeper dive. And again, first do no harm, even though you could buy it over the counter. Um, so yeah, so you, uh, sorry, I, I went back to the- No, no, that was so important because <laughs> yeah. I don't think people realize that. I don't think people, you know, I don't even know that people realize that for pain, things can be done. Like we're going to get into the food and all the amazing things you do. But that's, that's why I really wanted to have you on because a lot of people just think, oh, and, and this impacts, you know, when people are trying to exercise for their bones and do all these great things. But if they're having pain, it's going to limit everything they can do. And so many people think, oh, that's just the way it is. I'm older. I have to have the knee pain or I have to have the arthritis. It's just part of aging. And it doesn't have to be that way. And that's, I think, the exciting part is that there's so much that we can do. So why don't you tell us? You talked about the structural, you looked at the structural and, you know, so that's step one. And in terms of, and so would you recommend then, you know, for people listening to see someone who looks at the structural, such as an osteopath who does this or a physiatrist, or is that your recommendation to, or to yeah. just get it looked at? Yeah. Physical uh, therapist. Uh, even. Uh, yeah. Again, somebody, and it's so, it's, it's so funny because it seems so random because if you go to a doctor, you know, oftentimes people don't know where to go, right? Like, yes. Who's the best person? Because there's so many people that can look at, say, back pain, right? You can go to a physical therapist. You can go to your GP. You can go to an orthopedic surgeon. You can go to a physiatrist. You can go to an osteopath. You can go to an energy healer. Like, it's so, you know, confusing. So I get that. It's real. And it, it seems somewhat random that, you know, you have to kind of happen upon a practitioner that is really curious, that is really thoughtful, I think, skilled for sure educated, trained, but also thoughtful about what the recommendations are going to be, because you just want sort of a comprehensive 360 look at your, you know, pain complaints. And you, you said something that's, that's so true. So many of us, um, I see so many people that just attribute their pain to aging, like this is normal. It is not normal to be in pain. And we know through science, through, you know, epigenetics, which like 80%, and we'll talk about that in a bit, but 80% of how we age, feel, and function is how we behave. And I say that for those of us who want to make healthy changes and choices, that's really good news because, yay, I could do it differently, right? But for those of us who are like, oh, I'm just a victim of my genes or my circumstances or... That's sort of not the best road to go, but I feel for those people, but I, I try to actually, you know, motivate them to make life choices and decisions that are going to support their health because it's not normal to be in pain. And sometimes people are stopped by their pain and limited by their pain from fear. I see that a lot. So that's another reason why it's super important for me to communicate where the pain is coming from. If I do a physical examination, oftentimes it's just like a muscle, like a trigger point or a muscle strain or something so easy that, oh, by the way, an x-ray or an MRI are not going to pick up because it doesn't pick that up, right? So many times we, we just run through the basics and we run right to sort of technology to give us the answer. But most definitely the work I do, what I figure out, it's reading between the lines, doing a comprehensive history taking conversation with the patient and a hands-on physical examination 
there is no substitute for that. I just sort of read and heard something about like AI and artificial intelligence and how it, you know, could, you know, that we have to have a thoughtful approach of when to, when technology intervenes, but there's nothing like a skilled practitioner that's going to get it. And that's going to read the body literally. Cause I always say the body doesn't lie. The body will give us so much information. People may lie, but the body, <laughs> but, the, but the body doesn't lie. <laughs> So, so true. So let's get to the food because there are foods that are inflammatory that can irritate joint pain and actually exacerbate pain. And there are foods that heal. So what advice would you give people listening in terms of food, what you've seen with all of your years and practice? My favorite topic is food um, because it's yummy and delicious, but it all, you know, foods can literally heal or harm and I really, I know a lot. I, and by the way, didn't I did not learn this in medical school? I, true confessions. Going to medical school, I lived on diet coke and Velveeta. <laughs> like I'm embarrassed to say, but I'm telling the truth. So this is really a learned process for me. Even though I mentioned I was, um, I managed the food co-op, a health food co-op on the campus of my university. I was really not that knowledgeable about how important it is, but food is literally information for ourselves, right? So, and food is a hot topic. Food is a personal topic. Food is a pleasure. I get all of that. But my very strong suggestion, because I follow the science on all this, food is literally like medicine. I said it can help it and it can harm. And I always preface every conversation. First of all, my patients, when they come to see me, on my intake sheet, they I ask about their diet, their movement and their exercise, their stress and their management of, their sleep patterns, and also their vices and devices, which I have like a five point kind of, I attack it from all sides. People come in with back pain and they don't know that I'm gonna kind of <laughs> be talking to them about what they had for dinner, but I can't think of a more important, it's literally, information for ourselves, what we're putting in our body, it's chemistry, right? We can't deny that. And in our hyper convenient processed food world, and I really try to meet people where they're at at this because it's very personal. So I always start by saying, if you want to feel well, we have to chat about what you're choosing to eat. Because there are, as you mentioned, foods that are inflammatory in the body. The the biggest offenders there are highly processed food, sugar, right? We know this. It just, boom, just ramps up. And then if we want to be happy and healthy and functioning well, having pain is nothing that we want, right? So what motivates people, you know, I, I feel like I got them a little bit when they have pain, right? They're coming in and they're motivated to feel better. And I try to, the gold standard, as I tell everybody, and everybody's at a different place, the gold standard, we know this, this is science, this is evidence-based. I'm literally going to digest the global research on the connection between food and health. And oh, by the way, the biggest issue for morbidity, mortality, morbidity meaning disease, and mortality meaning death, is food. The food choices we make has the largest impact on how we feel, how we function, what diseases we get, what diseases we don't get. And you may be thinking like, oh, but what about our genes? What about our, you know, doesn't that matter? Yes, that matters, but we have a tremendous ability to impact the expression of our genes with our food. So I've ramped up to this like, you know, high moment here, but the gold standard for all of us for for eating nutrition is something called a whole food plant based diet. What does that mean in English? Right? It like what what does that mean? Uh, we're just going to eat grass all day? Like what like what we possibly do here? My brother, you know, I, we talked about Mediterranean diet. He's like, I can't eat hummus all day long. So let's just sort of break it down to sort of normal when you're either ordering from Fresh Direct at the pandemic or going to the store safely. Um, the more, and this is what, this is what, this is how you met me, the literal prescription on my New York state prescription pad. I keep it on my desk. I take it out. People are like, uh Oh, wait, wait, I didn't think she prescribed a lot of medication. And I start writing fruits, vegetables, beans, nuts, and sort of minimal whole grains. Now 
that sounds so basic. It seems like something that you learned in kindergarten. That's true. Or something your grandmother may have told you, like eat your vegetables. But what the exciting thing about this is this is literally medicine. Once again, it's feeding our cells. It's keeping our blood sugar down. It's keeping our obesity rate down, which we know now COVID, we have to say, you know, it's a timely topic. Obesity is the number one driver of, you know, this is a moment of health that now like, like no other in this, you know, really difficult, challenging pre-existing conditions are never good. So the, this messaging, I've been talking about this for 30 years, but we all are a little more, you know, our ears are perked up because we have to be conscious of public health and health. Um, and I find, and I find this as an exciting moment to make food the cornerstone because we know this, the food is really the a portal. I say pain is a portal to optimize health. Food is really the cornerstone of keeping our bodies and our minds healthy. I know you do a lot of happiness work, which I'm totally for. Um, and we know that there's a huge food and mood connection also. So what I'm, this fruits, veggies, beans, and nuts that I'm literally writing on my New York State, you know, doctor prescription pad. This is really the, the optimal medicine from nature and the side effects are all positive. There's no negative side effects. And sometimes I, I need, people need me to help them. But like, what do you eat? Can I just, I can't just eat carrots all day. Like, so I literally will write columns of, you know, uh, vegetables. What do you like? You know, I'll talk to my baby. What do you like? And I, I try to give, you know, recipes or what I eat or what to do because people really need, you know, they're like, oh, they, it's just, it's, it's too much of a gap, you know, uh, of what they're eating and what they really sort of need to eat. But I can't emphasize this enough that when people start making changes in their, in this food of being close to nature, getting the micronutrients, it's kind of magical in a very simple way. And when I say magical, I I'm with full respect to that. This is totally science-based. This isn't just my idea because I worked at a food co-op you know, or, and oh, by the way, eating this way, we're in a climate crisis as well. Um, you know, eating a whole food plant-based diet is one of the best things you can be doing for the planet. Um, animals as well. So I'll, I'll throw that in there, but I come at it from a health standpoint, but it really is the same prescription, by the way, those of you that are thinking about climate change, which we all should be thinking about, it's the same prescription for our health and planetary health. So I'll put that out there as food for thought for some people who haven't, you know, connected those dots exactly. You know, it sounds so simple and it's so, it's so crazy, especially you're right though about this pandemic that we've seen that the people who have these existing conditions and the obesity, these are the people, there's a big difference in how they're handling this. And we see how important it is that now's the time to get rid of these risk factors and, and make the changes. So I'm only hoping that it's motivating people to live a healthier lifestyle and starting with the food is so important. But what have you seen as a person that deals with pain? So your people come in, you change their diet. How long do you, does it typically take till you start seeing reduction in pain from just the, there's just the change in diet? Yeah, I only I don't only do diet, but I it, it's a it's amazing. My dad always asked me, he's like, "Well, do people just do what you say?" It's all over the map, and there's a real continuum. I just had a new patient the other the other day, and young person, lovely person, pain issues. You know, diagnosed as migraine, but it was really coming from the neck, which a lot of people miss, right? Because there's a much yes. little component, and the, you know, as a physical therapist, right? So we did the whole 360. I can't help myself. I do everything. She came in and she, she came in and we, she's like, I know I eat terribly. I know it has to do with my pain and uh, please tell me what to do and please make it easy for me. Because as you said, this is simple, but keep in mind, it's not easy to change behavior, right? It's simple. The information's simple. And my brother, who's an orthopedic surgeon kind of mocks me. He's like, what do you do? Like everybody knows don't eat Doritos and get some exercise. Like, Okay. That's true. It's not like breaking news, but the real breaking news is that this really, really, really matters. And we know that the choices that we make really, really, really matter. So there are some patients, as you asked me, who will literally do like a 180, like they're drinking soda and they're like, oh my God, you told me that 
Diet Coke is going to leach calcium out of my bones. I just stop. They'll come in the next time. I'll be like, oh my God, that's amazing. And I do, I give them so much credit because to really make that behavior change, that's the magical piece, right? I'm digesting all the science. I'm telling them what to do. And I, and it, it's true. I'm not in, interested in wasting people's time or, or energy if it's not important. And I tell people that I said, you know, and this, and I said, I wish, I'm sure you have a lovely apartment, but I'm not going to be coming home with you. So these are things that I can help, you know, I can help guide you. I can help teach you. I can help motivate you. I can help coach you. You know, I, I can, but you, you're going to have to make the choices and I'm going to bug you about it because I'm going to write it down and I'm going to make a copy and we're going to talk about it next time. So some people do a radical reboot and start changing things. Some people, it's a process. And some people, of course, like not at all, but the people who make the changes start feeling better, start functioning better. It affects everything from sleep. I even, even though I'm a musculoskeletal, non-surgical orthopedist, right? Uh, I see people with, you know, reflux issues. I see people, and now especially like we as a, a, a a planet have gotten way unhealthier since COVID. I mean, there's a 42%, I just read some stats this morning, 42%, you know, have gained like 29 pounds. That's no good. 70% of adults are obese, not good, right? These are, we're not, uh, alcohol use is up, women 41%, men 9%, you know, I mean, these are trying times. So like to be, you know, optimally, we all need help, support and assistance at this time. But I would argue that, you know, the best thing we can do, and so many things are not controllable right now, the best thing we can do is sort of like take this in and make choices for ourselves so that we are resilient mentally, physically, supporting our bodies. We do have control over what we put in our mouths. We do have control over how we stock our refrigerator and our cabinets. So... Again, you know, building a platform of sort of health for our bodies so we're not getting diabetes, so we're not getting, you know, arthritic pain, right? From not just the pure weight, but just the chemical. You can be skinny and have a lot of pain, right? If you're eating, and oh, by the way, you can be vegetarian or vegan and be a junk food vegetarian or vegan. So I want to say that's why that whole food, eating things from nature, eating things from the ground, eating things with micronutrients, best medicine in the world. If you just think nature and buy, try to not buy things that are literally in a bag or a box, like singular ingredients is what I, I recommend for my patients. You could buy a can of beans. You don't have to soak your beans overnight. And I'm very sensitive to the, you know, there's a lot of like working moms working at home now with young children. And, you know, this is stressful, stress, stressful times. But the answer is not a donut or, you know, chips, or it's just, it's just not, it's such a, if we could train ourselves, right, to think long term, it's a little bit of pay now or pay later. And then once you get into the habit of it, you don't want to do things that are going to make you feel badly, like they're going to, that are going to, you want to, you want to eat in a way that it's going to help control your pain. And we know this, right? Again, I'm going to say it again, fruits, Anyone, you know, if you're not allergic to anything or you have no, you know, issues, fruits, anyone, any kind. I like to say also that people are sometimes get into the weeds like, oh, I shouldn't eat bananas because, you know, it has a high glycemic index. And I always say bananas are not, you know, there's so much confusion out there because there's so much confusion about food. But bananas are not anybody's problem. Trust me, that's not the problem. You know, eating a, an extra banana is not, you know, going to send you into sort of a diabetic situation, right? It's, um, I know, by the way, beans is a very good way to keep your blood sugar down. So people also talk about protein all the time, right? There's the keto and, oh my, you know, the, the answer we know, again, I'm going to make it simple for people from science, the more fruits, vegetables, beans, nuts, and minimal whole grains, any vegetable, anytime, any fruit, anytime, Nuts, if you're trying to lose weight, not so many because they're a little bit calorically dense. Beans, beans, more beans, best protein around, great fiber, black beans, hummus, like all of it. So I just 
you know, I know how people think they're like, but what am I going to eat? So I, that's why I gave some details. <laughs> no, that's great. No, I think that's so important. And what about, why don't you talk about the microbiome? Because what they found now, the diversity, because you're, I, I love how you're bringing in all these different things. It's not just that, you know, some people get sort of stuck in their ways where they have yeah. the same food. So why don't you talk a little bit about, you know, the, this great diversity and what happens and what, what the science has shown now is amazing. I, I love that conversation because people will say like, oh, I'm taking my probiotic as a pill and like, I'm good. Yeah, not really, right? We, we don't have really good science around probiotics. And a lot of people don't know this, but like vegetables are really prebiotics, right? They feed, as you say, the trillions of organisms that live in our gut. And the gut, by the way, gut brain, there's a big connection there. Again, food, mood. A lot of people don't know, but 90% of our immune system is in our gut, right? So we are basically, it may sound disgusting to some people, but we're just like a bag of microorganisms, right? And the food we eat changes the diversity and it gives us so much protection of, we call the microbiome, which is the organisms that live in our gut that are a great predictor of our health, our immunity, our well-being, our disease state. So feeding the right things and the diversity, which you say, yeah, we do get stuck, get stuck in a rut. Oh my God, we're all in such a big rut over the past year. But what I recommend specific, and I'm the same, I like cut up my sweet potato wedges and like, that's like a, a favorite. And, you know, I make it for my neighbors even. And I'm like, okay, like what else? All right. I bought purple potatoes you know, the, the next time, you know, something a little different. So, and diversity is kind of fun, but my God, we all need some novelty right now. But the more diverse, we talk about this, you know, there's, believe it or not, I think there's like a thousand species of banana, not available to us. We only think of like the regular banana that we get in the store, but the more we can diversify our diet with healthy things, the more sort of just beautiful our microbiotic landscape is right because diversity is king we're trying to do this with our soil now and grow you know we we go down to monoculture which is a super bad thing for agriculture and the planet but in our in our bodies we want to be adventurous i'm giving you permission to be adventurous if all this sounds like oh my god this sounds terrible i can only eat fruits vegetables beans and nuts um but within those categories there's literally i don't know that I'm making this up thousands, hundreds of thousands of options. So when you go shopping, if you do, if you do have, or if you're looking online to, to buy like, Ooh, what's jicama? Ooh, let's try a turnip. Ooh, let's. So that's how I approach it. I see something I, I do go out I'm vaccinated, luckily, fortunately. So I go out and I'm choosing my, my vegetables and, Oh, let's try some golden beets. By the way, colorful is good. Colorful has more, a, like if you have a choice between a, white cauliflower or purple color cauliflower, go for the purple. It has more micronutrients in it. If you don't like purple, enjoy your white. Don't worry about it. But just as a little sort of fun tip, the more, as we say, eat a rainbow every day, but not gummy bears or candy rainbow, right? <laughs> we mean like fruits and vegetables rainbow. So diversification is, is huge in life in general and in our food choices. So that's a really, really important point. We should try for new and keep adding, you know, and rotate. But the other thing is don't suffer through things you don't like. Like, oh, I, I don't like broccoli. Bleh. You know what? Eat some Brussels sprouts. Eat the things you love. I say this, that also love you back, that you like, that you enjoy, that it's pleasure. This is an interesting scientific fact. You know how you, you, we like things, we say, oh, I'm salivating for it, or like you, you literally like, ooh, you, you, get, you get your saliva going when you're excited about eating something. That actually, we get more, food is more bioavailable when we like it, because we're literally secreting more enzymes to break down the food. So don't suffer through things that, uh, I know I should eat it, forget that. There's too many other good choices. So making it fun, being happy with that is, is huge. Wow. In terms of any, are there any things that you found, you know, when people are in pain, are there any superfoods that you found especially helpful? Like, is there anything that you think in the plant kingdom or, you know, are there things that, is there any, anything in particular that you would say to people where to start if they're adding something new besides all the vegetables or any one in particular? 
This may be a kind of a sideways thing that people don't think about, but spices, uh, ginger is a huge anti inflammatory A lot of people, some people don't like it, um, but fresh ginger, you get fresh ginger root, make it into a tea. Turmeric, we know is a giant, right? So I'm, I'm going, I just started eating cumin. I really don't know the science of it, but my friend, my friend got like two giant things and she couldn't, she gave me one. I'm like, I added to everything. I think there's some anti-inflammatory benefit in that. We know that blueberries are really good for the brain and memory. Um, foods that are rich in magnesium, black beans, huge for muscular pain. So, um, and again, fruits and vegetables, it's just, it's a, it's a giant um, anti-inflammatory. And like we talked about before, Advil and over the cat, it's not even closed. You're like changing your body chemistry. How exciting. I mean, I think it's, it's super exciting, you know, just, just with food and then it, you know, your digestion is improved and like all sorts of good things start happening. So just a plug for flaxseed meal is really good. Black beans, really good. All sorts of fruits and vegetables. I want to say bok choy is an excellent choice if you want to. And, and also, you know, we're all from different cultures and backgrounds. So this doesn't mean like abandoning your sort of family culture around food. It just means tweaking it so that you're supporting your body, your microbiome, your joints and your, your overall health. So what is your recommendation in terms of a natural approach? Someone's really in pain, you know, instead of taking an Advil, is there anything that you recommend they could put on it? Or is there anything that is a, is a healthier option? Yeah, um, I'm a, a fan of, I mean, if they're going to sort of buy something or like yeah. Arnica, Arnica, which is a topical, um, the ma often, you know, the manual work I do identifies the pain, but also could relieve the pain by stretching the fascia, by having, by putting the body in a mechanical place to start healing itself. Oftentimes I see a lot of this, a lot of pain is from just patterning, right? And postural, right? So now we'll take a, a timely thing like now, right? Everybody's like literally on their computer, you know, neck pain, shoulder pain, back pain from sitting for too long. Just the, the kind of, uh, I'll use the word magic again, but the science of what I do really is figuring out where the pain is coming from. Is it coming from a joint? Is it coming from a muscle? Is it coming from fascia, which is connective tissue? I see a lot of, like I mentioned before, dancers and musicians who do the same literal choreography all day long. We all do the same literally literal choreography all day long of either sitting by the computer, which I call my office athletes, <laughs> um, and we get into a postural pattern of twisting. And what happens is we don't get optimal circulation to that area, right? Because there's a little bit of a restriction in the body or a range of motion. And it becomes, I see this a lot, that pain nobody's identified the root cause of pain, right? And then patients are afraid to move because they don't want to damage anything because they're not quite sure what it is. And then they don't move. And then they go more into that sort of dysfunctional patterning, right? And then they don't exercise because they don't want to damage anything. And then they get more deconditioned and it's not supporting their bones and their joints. So I'm almost like a, a you know, a window to like get information of like, what is this really what can I do in the safe lane, right? I do OMT or osteopathic manip manipulation on every single person that I see. I have not figured out how to do that virtually yet, <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I do actually have patients that are like spraining their ankle and I could, you know, put them through an exam, you know, virtually, but I can't use this tool to help to do my manual work on my patients. So, but in the office, which I'm now seeing people in the office with windows open and masks and, you know, um, there's that, that's one piece of what I do. Cause I can, again, read the body and then treat the body. Often patients will leave like, Oh my God, that feels better. Like th that was it. Like that was, and when I, when I'm manually diagnosing people, I will ask the question often all my patients may, who may be listening, like, is this familiar? Is this it? Is this the epicenter? Is it radiating any place? Right. Again, I see myself as an investigative reporter of figuring out, you know, where it's coming from. But you asked, what do I do? People are in pain. People want to be out of pain quickly. So I get the, oh, my God, just give me an Advil. I can't deal with this. Right. Um, Advil. And, and that's on the benign end of it. Right. We, you know, we have an opioid epidemic. Right. So which is a, a real crisis in that, you know, unfortunately, 
people without a medical background, you know, can go to a doctor and they could be given a, an opioid for a pain problem, which is could end up tragic, right? So we really want to meet the problem, you know, in the, again, first do no harm, right? In the most thoughtful, sensible way. We don't need nuclear arms for a simple sprain, right? Or a little bit of a muscle ache. So non-pharmacological things, I often heat or ice, depending on the problem is another thing. Um, I do give trigger point injections very uh, rarely, but that's something that I do because sometimes people need it, something a little more um, sort of, uh, you know, if it's not responding to my manual work, there are home exercises, which I do. I prescribe exercise on a regular basis because what I do, I want the patient to be, you know, kept in a position where the body's going to continue to heal itself and feel and function optimally. So everybody gets a prescription. We talked about my prescription pad where there's food, but I often also write for exercise. I also write for sleep because, you know, and I, I help people sort of break down why they're not sleeping. Um, because as we know, our whole body chemistry changes, right? If we're in pain, if we're not sleeping well, you know, we get a, a flood of, you know, either supportive or destructive, right, hormones that can put us in a direction of unhealthy and unhappy or healthy and happy. So, you know, these are all things that I try to figure out with patients um, because it's generally multifactorial. There's not you know, unless, you know, somebody could be like running down the street and they fall and they like hurt their knee. Okay. That's kind of obvious, but most of the things I see Margie have a multifactorial root, root cause, right? It could be their foods could be inflammatory, maybe not sleeping so great, maybe drinking a little too much wine. I know I sound like I'm just like a Grinch, but that's hugely inflammatory. And I have to mention that because that's a way, and some people self-medicate, you know, and even now, I, you know, either mentally or physically, that's not helping the cause. You know, I always tell patients and I'm, you know, sensitive to this, but I want to meet people where they're at, but I'm like, nah, it's not helping so much. You know, what you're doing is, is really not helping. So I really try to figure out all the triggers to why the pain is, is like it is. And my, my answer to it is always getting rid of the pain, but also preventing it from coming back. I feel responsible to do that, right? Because I have the tools and the information to, okay, we can we can fix your back pain. Like we got this, but you probably have better things to do with your time than to be sitting in my office, right? I mean, and I have lovely patients, so I enjoy seeing them, And but probably better if they're out doing what they want to do, right? So wow. a little bit of we my could, approach. We could talk for hours. There's so <laughs> many things. Oh my goodness. But I think, I think what's so fabulous that you shared is that because people are in pain, they think, ah, no big deal, but no big deal, nip it in the bud before it Absolutely. becomes a chronic condition and see a practitioner. If you live in New York City, we'll give your information, but see a practitioner who will be able to look at the root causes, deal with the nutrition aspect. So the, I just love all the facets that you look at that, you know, the importance of the healthy eating and the plants, as well as the structural. And I see that all the time as well, too, with the structure. And so many people just don't realize that, that things can be improved, that they don't have to live with it. And I think that's what's so exciting. And the epigenetics part that you can turn on and off your genes. So it's really empowering. It's really, we don't have to live with things. And you've just shared so much. How, so tell us how people can find out about you or follow you. What's the best way? Oh, thanks. Um, it would be my pleasure to help anybody who feel they feel like they can, you know, they're in pain and they want sort of a sensible root cause approach. Um, I practice, I have an actual office in New York City um, on Central Park South. Again, facing the park with window open, windows open. So ventilation is good. The park is there. That's healing in and of itself. Um, and my, you can email me at Dr. Dr. Lilly, L-I-L-L-I-E, Rosenthal, uh, common spelling, R-O-S-E-N-T-H-A-L at Gmail. My website has a ton of information, my speaking engagements, my media, things I've written about pain. If you, if you don't live in New York, I do virtual, I do phone, you know, this day I did even before COVID. But happy to see you in the office. That's always the best because I'm like a hands-on personal person. Um, virtually, you know, just shoot me an email. Um, I'd love feedback. If you have any feedback on anything I said, um, I love what I do. I'm always happy to share information. 
My website is um, Dr. Lily Rosenthal, same spelling, uh, .com. And I have, again, tons of information of things I've written about, you know, pain, about food, about fitness as the fountain of youth. I can go on and on, um, but I'm happy to, you know, help you feel better in any way I can. So, and Margie, this was just a delight. Oh, well, I'm just so excited because I think people need to hear this, that there is hope and so much they can do because I can't, you know, it, it's something that just starts you on that negative spiral. And there's no reason, as you said, it, you know, we look, we start with that, find the root cause, and then every aspect of your health can get better. So it's really a win-win situation. Well, thank you. This has been so much fun. I'll have to come visit you in New York City myself. And <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> see all the great things that you're doing. So thanks so much for sharing all this great information. And I look forward to staying in touch. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed today's interview with Dr. Rosenthal as much as I have, and now have a new perspective on pain and pain management. I love how Dr. Rosenthal puts it, that pain is a puzzle to be solved rather than a symptom to be suppressed. So don't wait till your pain is so bad that it's affecting every area of your health and well-being. Find a practitioner and, and right away, nip it in the bud, see what the root cause is so that you can live as happy and healthy as you possibly can. And all the links that Dr. Rosenthal talked about will be in the show notes. And if you're lucky enough to live near New York, Dr. Rosenthal sees patients and she helps people, as she mentioned, through both food, lifestyle, and she has the manual skills to also help really figure out the source of your pain. So also I wanted to let you know that I will be doing a webinar on the three hidden secrets to happiness, which is also something that affects pain. So you can find all that information in the show notes as well. So thanks so much for listening. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode.